Ali, we made it. We did. <laughs> Studio work is done. I took this home, uh, did all the buttoning up, if you will. So intakes were installed super easy, like you said. Tip tanks were installed super easy. I did some graphics, minor graphics. I noticed uh, the touch up pass, very nice, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then just buttoned up the inside. So mounted whatever wasn't mounted, mounted the switch, made sure everything was secure, that sort of thing. Um, I have gone through and checked everything, charged the packs up. So in my opinion, this is a ready to fly aircraft. Um, but you know, it's important to talk about a couple of the things as far as kind of getting ready. We did, a, we did a basic AS3X setup. Now this is if you're using Spectrum. Um, and let's talk a little bit about gyro setup because before we turn on the engine and get going, it's an important thing, you know, checking directions is paramount. Whatever gyro system you're using, this is, uh, a, a, this is actually not AS3X, this is actually using an iGyro uh, for right now, we're testing it out. But we did all that setup and it seems to be working. Directions are checked and we'll adjust the gain in the air, but. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it's a complicated aeroplane, but it's actually quite simple. Um, it's complicated if you're coming into it like you as a first time uh, jet guy. For, for someone like me that's done it for a while now, the systems all seem natural. So this video isn't for someone like me. It's, you know, it's for someone like you and somebody sure. watching the video as a first timer. So yeah, you know, what you've done going home, the buttoning up process, the not rushing process, um, tidying up inside, getting hands on, really, really does make a big difference because there's so many systems. You know, you look at some of our bind and fly airplanes, you take out of the box, it's a motor, it's an ESC, it's a receiver and some servos. Right. In between this, we have fuel pumps, we have ECUs, we have gear controllers, you know, we have brake controllers, we have a secondary fuel tank. There's a lot there. Yeah. Done right, they're super simple but rushed and not checked diligently, they can become you know, a, a problem. So the way you've done it is not in rushing is great. Out of the field, as you say, we're now running through the systems checks. The instinct for you, I'm sure it was the same for me, and I'm sure it's the same for you, is you just want to go and fly it. <laughs> it's well worth at this stage taking time, yep. you know, setting aside half a day of just prep checking, engine running, gear checking, brake checking, gyro checking is a big one, uh, fuel systems, getting the fuel system wet and soaked so it doesn't leak, you know, be amazed how many people the first time I see them go to fly, they fill it up and oh, there's a leak, you know. <laughs> let's not rush this stage, there's a lot to go through. Done right, this aeroplane should be as simple to operate as some of our, you know, like 1.5 meter Mustangs. It's, it's a, a very proven system. Um, we just now need to go through the last stages of getting it set. And um, no better place than the gyro. You know, you touched on that. A great, great aid. Does this aeroplane need a gyro? Heck no, not at all. Flies great without a gyro. Does it fly better with a gyro? Heck yes, incredibly so. You know, it takes out the lumps and bumps, takes out the stress when you're flying. It makes the airplane feel bigger and smoother. So I'm all for, you know, I'm a massive advocate of gyro use, especially in complicated heavy airplanes. Um, so yeah, you know, with that in mind, we're using the iGyro in this particular airplane. There's lots of different systems out there. RAS3X, there's Cortex, there's iGyro. There's really now not any bad systems out there. Um, but with all of them, they require a bit more diligence, a bit more um, methodical checking before you go and fly because a gyro installed incorrectly is a massive hindrance, not a help. Sure. So with that in mind, we're gonna go through now what I call the double, triple and quadruple <laughs> checks of the gyro. And that is predominantly based around the direction, making sure the gyro helps you and not fights you. Sure. Quick overview, you know, if the airplane rolls right, we want the gyro to damp that roll with a little bit of left aileron, say. Yeah. If the gyro is installed incorrectly, the wrong way around, or the orientation's wrong, it'll make it worse, it'll add right. Mm -hmm. So we need to like triple, quadruple check, and two people check, I'm a big advocate of having a second set of eyes, that when the airplane rolls right, we see a little bit of left aileron. When the airplane yaws right, we see a little bit of left rudder. When the airplane pitches down or pitches up, it has the opposite elevator effect. Right. So yeah, with that, my way of doing that is we, together we'll hold the plane, turn the gyro up, just maximum, maximum gain, so we see the most amount of input, and we'll roll it left, left. Left, do it like 10 times if you have to, and then let somebody else check it. Sure. You cannot check that enough. And if there's any doubt, stop. 
go back into the bench, you know, go back to the workshop, yeah. don't risk it. And um, that will apply when it comes to flying it as well. We've got, I've got a couple of hints and tips on setting the gyro up and how we can avoid incidents um, in that stage. So yeah, there's lots to go through. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and power the plane on and we'll do that setup and then we'll talk a little bit about CG because my airplane ended up being a little bit different, at least a, as a setup from your the ones you've built because we changed the, where the UAT is mm -hmm. compared to some of the demo ones. But let's go and jump in and then we'll talk about fuel system or fueling it up and all that. I'll okay. go ahead and power it on. Guys, I, I basically just have a, a switch that I've mounted on a uh, 3D printed little block here. I can put the link to our Thingiverse page there, um, but it should fire right up and everything should rock and roll. Now we'll let it kind of boot up here and let the gyro settle in. And again, a lot of the setup you're not going to see on camera from the gyro setup because it's always, everyone uses a different gyro more than likely. And uh, you know, the setup for this one's going to be a lot different than yours. But I'd say, all right, so we've got full control here. Everything's looking good. Flaps are good. So now uh, gain all the way up. And I guess we can do the checks. Yeah, go through. I mean, every gyro has a different implementation system. Um, shameless plug here, but RAS3X <laughs> has it all done through the radio now, forward programming. You can set orientations and directions all through that. I love that. The iGyro is a little bit more complicated than that. It requires some button pressing and some movements. Just go through the instructions. If you're in any doubt, look on YouTube. There are so many good videos on iGyro setup. I mean, we use Martin Pickering's video for yeah, your iGyro setup. So I'm a you know, big fan of sharing knowledge, sharing information. So yeah, don't be ashamed. Don't be shy to go on and, and use those uh, tools as they're intended. But um, yeah, we did that. We've gone through that. We were pretty sure, but yeah, crank the gyro up all the way. If you grab the back end, yep. Um, what we're going to do now, Steve, is we're going to lift the airplane up. We're going to roll the airplane to the right, and we're looking for the gyro to kick in some left aileron. And it'll only be a short burst because we're not running heading hold. It'll be the dampener aspect of the sure. gyro. So you, you probably want to see it on camera, but you, you and I will be able to see that left aileron yep. coming up. So ready? All right. If you keep a close eye on that, I'm going to roll right now. Yep. There it is. Yep. There. Yep. Okay. And the opposite. We're going to roll left now. See the right aileron coming up. Ready? There it is. That's good. And to now with rudder, I'm going to yaw the rudder to the left. I'm looking for opposite rudder at your end. Okay. Yep. See it. Yep. And vice versa. Yep. That's good to me. Okay. And now I'm going to pitch the nose up. I'm looking for down elevator. Yep. I felt it too. There you go. So. All right. That's it. Another way of doing it is you can move the actual gyro module itself. You can see here as I'm wiggling it, um, yeah. but it's better with two people. Double double check. Sure. So, okay. Yeah, that's the gyro set. Now, I would recommend personally. I'm a little bit no, I'm a lot of bit complacent with gyros because I use them so often and I'm very confident with the setup of them. So I actually take off first flights with gyro on. I don't technically recommend that, um, simply because if there is an opportunity or is a chance that you've got one of the directions reversed, down low, it gets ugly. So with newbies to gyros, what I recommend is get the airplane up, trimmed, flying, a mistake or two mistakes high, start implementing the gyro gradually. And if it starts really feeling like something's going wrong, 99% of the times it means you've got something round backwards. Yeah. So stop, turn the gyro off, and remember, when that gyro switches off, when that gain goes to off, that's like a $200 Y lead. It's not infecting, <laughs> it's not actually impacting the way the plane flies. So if in any doubt, make the gyro so it switches off. And later on, that's a big, big, um, how can I say, belief of mine, mindset of mine, I always have an off switch. Mm -hmm. Some people don't do it, and listen, it's everyone, everyone has their own different means of, of you know, skinning a cat, say, I like the fact that if anything goes wrong, let's say the gyro comes disconnected, sure. it's floating around, I want to be able to switch it off and just have the aeroplane au naturel. So, big advocate of that. Yeah, it's a good safety barrier, right? You've got a problem, turn it off. Correct. It's, like you said, it's a, it's just in between the control surfaces at that point. That's it. So. Okay, so CG, um, I, I, we've got all the batteries in the nose of this airplane as far forward on the landing gear kind of mount or block as we can. The UAT is actually in the forward section. Yep. Um, so, and all the, I guess the iGyro, the receiver, the landing gear module, everything's in the front as we built it, as you guys saw in the studio. And I've found that it's actually pretty, pretty on point to what we say from the, the, the CG measurement. I know you had mentioned in some of the earlier models or some of your demo models, you actually have a little nose weight in yours. And yeah, I don't need it. we were using heavier engines now. The center of gravity is roughly, it's never really going to be that far. We give a CG range. I'm a big yeah. advocate of 
center of gravity ranges, not an exact spot, because yep. everyone flies, it's like control surface deflections, or it's like exponentials, or dual rates, or switches. Everyone flies a different way. Sure. You know, that one center of gravity doesn't really apply, so what I give is a range, and we were finding with the early airplanes, with a slightly heavier tail group, and the heavier engines, which if you look, the engine's here, center of gravity is here, it's behind. Yep. So if you add a heavier engine, the CG is going to move back and you sure. need more nose weight to balance it. With those airplanes, the first ones, I was adding six to eight ounces of nose okay. weight. Now, in serial production and with the new lighter engines, particularly this new KingTech 86, yeah. which is a featherweight engine, we're running no nose weight. So yeah, you know, with the airplane, pick somewhere in that center of gravity range, midway is about right. Okay. Um, and balance it according to that. Yeah. Don't use, if the early aeroplanes came with these rigging um, balance cradle type wooden affairs, the factory put those in. Don't use those, follow the manual. The manual clearly states yeah. how to measure it. I'm not a big fan of the electronic scales. Um, there's a big group of people that love them in the high-end jet world. I'm not a big fan because I've seen a couple of uh, horror stories where people haven't set them up right. Mm. It's a light enough aeroplane, you can lift it with your fingers. It's a conventional aeroplane, I've said this before. This, you know, if we put a 20cc or 30cc gas engine in, it would be like our Tiger 30. <laughs> There's nothing funky with this aeroplane that means the center of gravity is here or here. It's, you know, you, with a third of the cord of the wing as a gen general consensus, you'll get flying. Okay. And in that CG range, from the very front to the very back, it's still completely flyable. Yeah. You're not going to end up with you know chasing a tiger by the holding a tiger by the sail thing. <laughs> so yeah, find a spot and adjust it. If you find like when you're flying and it comes into land and it's a bit pitch sensitive and porpoisey, put some weight in it, move stuff forward. Yep. If you find that when you're rolling inverted, you're putting a lot of down elevator in or your elevator feels heavy, move stuff back. So you know it's. Aim for six ounces of weight in the nose. You can put it in at six ounces and fly and gradually take it back sure. until it feels right. Your airplane, as you said, we set up everything forward, big 3200 Life E pack in the very front. Yep. Um, I've seen ones now with 5000s in, like <laughs> Jeff Holsinger, our team guy. He runs no nose weight and only three batteries because he uses the 5000 hard case packs. Okay. So yeah, well, we've got this right now. I picked it up. Listen, there's, there's not much the factory can do. They can maybe have one of these, which is two or three grams lighter. Right. It's not gonna, you're not suddenly gonna end up with a plane that needs four pounds of nose weight. <laughs> I've read that online. The guys with the CG stands or using those wooden things. They'll be like, oh, that's a four pounds of weight. I'm like, no, there's, unless, you know, your wallet's in the back there or something <laughs> like that, or a dumbbell, yeah. there's no reason for that. This aeroplane balance is pretty neutral. Um, so yeah, we check that on the bench. That's all set. Um, make sure everything's secure. It's one of those things that I've seen a couple of people recently that have those batteries just Velcroed in on the base with like, not the best application. Mm -hmm. Listen, in the best case scenarios, it will stay there, but you just want to have it so it's belt and braces. So go through it. Think about this airplane. It's doing 130, 140 miles an hour, pulling six to seven G. It's nice to have everything, you yeah. know, secure. Stuff will move if it's not secure. <laughs> Correct. Um, yeah, check all the usual stuff. Wing bolts are tight, tip tanks are tight, tail group especially tight. The elevators, I saw one recently, a guy taxiing out, hadn't tightened the elevator, got mm. away with it. Yeah. But um, it's amazing when you're overloaded with new stuff, what you forget, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Make a checklist if you have to, you know. I, for me, I've done lots of big ARF stuff before, so it's pretty methodical to put it together, you know, but you can easily skip a wing bolt if you're not thinking about it. Um, so definitely go through it. And yeah, I spent lots of time at home outside of this shoot day going through this thing and making sure it's gonna be right. Um, so if you're nervous about it, like I am, then by all means, check it over 10 times if you have to, so. On that subject, uh, of the CG where I was saying it's subjective, control throws as well. Mm. Control throws in the manual yeah. are very, what I call vanilla, right in the middle of the road. Um, don't live with that. If it feels slow to you in roll, up the aileron. If it feels sensitive to you in roll, lower the aileron. I'm a big fan of three-stage dual rates. Yep. They're, they're on the radio, especially if you bake in a template in the iX series, they're all set up with Expos play with the dual rates until you get the airplane that's feeling right for you. The one caveat to that, I will say, is the elevator on this airplane is super powerful. Super, super powerful. So, when you look at the deflections, don't be of the mindset of, you know, my, my 100cc slick, the elevator moves like that, and now I'm gonna get, 
it's going to end badly for you. <laughs> it's, this airplane's moving a lot faster. The surfaces are quite big. So it's super powerful. Don't overdo the elevator control throw. Have a dual rate so you, you can't pull it in and snap it. So Yeah, I can't I can't preach enough about if you're using an IX series or spectrum radios and we have the templates in here, if you use the BNF template, all of your rates are kind of set there Beautiful. for you. There you've got aileron elevator rudder already set up on the radio and you know we'll probably take off here with mid rates today um, but obviously you still have to do the mechanical adjustment but that radio is set that it's got a throttle cut it's got all the setup done for you it takes a ton of time out I use it now you taught me this at an event <laughs> when we had to redo all my planes and I mean, now I'm like the biggest advocate for it because it just saves time and time and, time. and you can set your own templates up now as well Steve yeah. the next stage you'll get to is you'll set one custom template that will have all your telemetries that you want mm -hmm. all the warnings that you want all the audio events yeah. that you want you'll set that up as stevie's jet template or steve's warbird template and then i, I can't preach enough about those yeah. and and the, the fact that the dual rates are there so yeah. good call mid rate is the best way to take off you've got less or more if you need it you yep. find you take off and it's really lethargic on ailerons give me some more mm -hmm. find it's too pitch sensitive give me give me a little less yeah. so yeah all right, so I will say next we'll do a quick landing gear check and then we'll start it up and do a range check. That's the next two best things, unless there's anything else you want to add. You filled it, you fuel soaked it, which I'm a big fan right. of. I like this fuel soaking thing. It sounds a bit daft almost, but it, you'd be surprised how many leaks can appear yeah. in a fuel system, whether it be a line split, whether it be a seal on the tank. I like the fact to have it, check around the airplane, check under the tank. Um, any liquid, be suspicious. Yep. Not only obviously leaking liquid is bad, but also if liquid can get out air can get in <laughs> right. air is the killer of all things turbine yeah. you know these jet engines are so much better than they used to be but they're still not very tolerant of having a constant air supply they just stop it set, it basically it sends the RPM and the temperature and the fuel, fuel pump PWs out of whack and for safety it just shuts down so if you see any fuel where it shouldn't be don't Problem. think it's gonna go away yeah. it's like an air leak it only gets worse right investigate fix okay all right, yeah, and uh, I guess I've got uh, here for startup, we've got our, our CO2 essential fire extinguisher, thanks to Rick Hayes from Hayes Fire for sending that out to me. Uh, and then, yeah, Jersey Modeler, this, this tank is spectacular. It's the first Jersey Modeler tank I've ever bought, but they're not cheap. But they, they work great. They're all set up for you. Really, really nice job. It's an so investment for life, Dean. Steve. You buy it yeah. once. I've got my jerseys now. In fact, the ones that I've got in England are now probably 15 years old. The ones I bought in the US are now eight years old. They've pumped hundreds of thousands of gallons, <laughs> I imagine, across the board um, of diesel and kerosene before diesel. So yeah, it's one of those things that you buy a cheap pump, you'll be forever regretting it. By a decent one, it's just one of those things you don't ever think of again. Yeah. So. And then, you know, use the King Tech oil, as you recommended. I'm using the King Tech engine, obviously, if you buy our combo. Um, we don't currently stock the King Tech oil. You can get it online or at other vendors. Um, obviously, essential to do your turbine. Don't just run straight diesel, you need to run oil. Um, and then I just wanted to say, you know, uh, Dean sent out, which we haven't installed it yet, but this is their closed loop system. So thanks, Dean, for sending this out. We're gonna try this out. But this just really makes the system, you can't, no fuel on your fingers, really. No air in the lines. I mean, this is a little complex to install, but at the end of the day, I think this will make this a lot more fun to fuel. You need one time where you go to fly and you've got diesel on your fingers where you've been filling for you to go, I'm gonna implement that system. I've yeah. been there, done it, um, and yeah, not a pleasant experience. Yeah. Extinguisher, essential, don't even consider starting without it. Not only is it a breach of what the AMA have written, rightly so, it's just one of those Murphy's Law situations. Every time I've seen a fire that's been catastrophic, it's been because there hasn't been a fire extinguisher present. And it happens so often because we get complacent. I'm guilty of this. Engines are so much more reliable now, Steve, that I go, you know what, same with the top hatch. I catch myself <laughs> now and again starting with the top hatch on. It's just like a given. That's the time you're going to have a wet start and not be able to see it until, you know, st stuff starts rippling inside because of the heat. Yeah. Always top hatch off, fire extinguisher present. Okay. Any, any site of a fire, it's like an air leak, like a fuel leak. Fires don't get better. Mm -hmm. They just get worse. As soon as you see flames, particularly in and around an area that's not conventional, at the back of the tailpipe of the engine, tail cone, yes, you will see some flame, particularly if you're starting in the evening or at dusk, yeah. it's a really cool effect. But you see anything else, 
I like the engine not spooling up and there's flame, hit it with the fire extinguisher. Don't take a chance. And that's the reason why we use CO2. Mm -hmm. A powder extinguisher, it's gonna ruin your engine. Yeah. Might save your plane, but it's gonna ruin your engine. CO2, it's 99% chance it's just gonna extinguish the flame and you'll have a usable engine once you've found out why it did have a wet start. Sure. All right, uh, want to do a gear check? I'll hold it up and we'll just make sure, sure the gear goes up and down. I guess we can, so if you want to just grab it, we can just yep. check it. And then let's see if that, uh, yeah, there was the arm, so it, now they should come up. Looks good there, coming back down. Maybe explain about the arming, Steve. Yeah, so what you guys saw there, that little uh, delay when I flicked the switch, is, is really the is really the, the gear module arming. Safety and, feature, yeah. Yeah, if you, if you happen to plug your plane in on the ground and it just, you don't want the gear to automatically come up, so it's that safety feature. So you just need to kind of flick your gear switch up and down and you'll hear a zzz sound and that's them arming. Very quickly, yeah, yeah, just toggle it. That's basically you telling the airplane, telling the gear unit, hey, I'm ready to fly. Right. Before you do that, if you flick the gear up by mistake on a other system, it will fold and collapse. This won't do it. It won't say, the, the, the gear module will be saying, hold on a second, the operator hasn't armed me, so I'm not going to function. Yeah. Gear check, same as an air check, same as a fire check and all that. If a gear is hanging on the ground, if a gear is snagging or, you know what? It never gets better. I've been that guy. <laughs> I've been the guy, I usually when I'm trying to show off at an air show or something like that, I go, ah, it'll be all right. <laughs> it's usually the time when I'm walking out there picking it up because one gear's stuck. So yeah. if you have any suspicions, any wires snagging at this stage, it's only going to get worse in flight. Fix it here on the ground, put on a stand, investigate, flip it upside down, cycle if you have to 10, 20 times and go, you know what, I'm happy, yeah. then fly. If in doubt, just wait. I mean, it's, it takes far longer to fix a broken wingtip or a broken wing or a scratched nose than it does to fix that gear issue. Yeah. All right, I think we're ready to go. Obviously, there's a couple radio setup things. We'll talk about nose wheel trim when we go to do a, do a brake test. check whilst we're here. Oh, yeah, I got brakes on this, so brakes on. There you go, release. Brakes off. There you yep. go. Yep. So on the subject of brakes whilst we're there, it's good to check them. Good to check them before every flight. Sure. Again, it's one of those devices that uh, you don't need them until you do. And then it's like, if it's, they're not working, it's too late. Um, this particular airplane, it's got very small wheels um, because of its size and because of the, 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 the aperture that they go inside the wing and small in comparison to the other big jets. But um, because of that, the brakes are very potent. Um, so the controller actually has two potentiometers built in, left and right, and they are your volume control for brakes. Mm -hmm. You can crank them right up and have the brakes come fully on. Do that knowing you're gonna flat spot the tires. That is gonna be a given. <laughs> we gave a free set of tires in every MB339 when it was released because that was my mindset. I didn't want people to lose a day's flying. We sell them as a spare part as well. But the way around that is set those potentiometers up so they don't snag. You know, you're looking for brakes a bit like a real car. You know, it's more effective if your brakes are functioning to the perfect point rather than just locking up. Yeah. You don't want this to lock up. So do some time, spend some time pushing, pulling, whatever, and adjusting those potentiometers. One, so you get braking so it doesn't lock the wheels, and two, so you get even braking. Right. You'll be surprised. You know, sometimes you need a bit of more left brake, a bit more right brake. Do it, it's time spent here that will save you that landing run where you lock the brakes up and the right brake, you know, smokes the tire and spins you around and tweaks the undercarriage and stuff like that. It's, it's so much worth, it's so worth spending the extra time here at this stage. Yeah, even just pushing it, you know, and then hitting the brakes, you can do it without having the engine on. So. Taxi tire that's yeah. tired as well, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm a big fan. Not all the time, but certainly the first flights. Do a whole tank taxi trialing it. You're not gonna overheat the engine. It doesn't need airflow over it to cool down. Mm. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna check the undercarriage system. You're gonna check the brakes. You're gonna check the fuel system. Yep. It's Steering much nicer to find an air leak here in the pits <laughs> than it is at the end of like your first circuit, just when you put the wheels up and the engine goes pew. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, now is the time to start it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, we can we can start it now. I, I think before starting it, and a, a thing I'd like to talk about is range checking. Yeah, sure. Because you can do range checks with the engine running or without the engine running. Hell, the best way to do it is you do it both and compare notes. Um, I'm a big fan of doing it with the engine running because to me, a range check is that last ditch, how can I say, 
opportunity to check the radio system to see how well the RF and, uh, is working. And the engine is just another part. It's the metal part that's spinning that's creating an RF noise that stresses the system. And that's what you know we aim to do on the range check. On our radio system, there's a range check mode that drops the power output, um, asks for 30 paces. I like to always do a 90 degree range check. So, you know, you'll be here with the airplane. I'll walk 30 paces, which is to the end of this um, uh, concrete area here. And you'll see me give that sign, which is you turn it 90 degrees. You turn it and I do it again, you turn it 90 degrees, yeah. 90 degrees. And what I'm doing there is I'm testing all the orientations of the satellite antennas. We're super lucky. We have four satellite antennas on our radio system. So we have four opportunities for that RF signal to grab to the uh, transmitter and receiver connection. Right. That still doesn't make it bulletproof. Sure. What we have in this aeroplane is still a massive liquid. We have a metal shield in that turbine. We have a metal tailpipe. If I wanted to, if I was really like just that way inclined, I could set the antennas up all around the engine and tailpipe that we'd get a lockout on the ground. We'd get a hold situation. <laughs> Obviously, we haven't done that. You've set it up. We've got one there, one there, one high. We've got all that diversity. Now what we're doing in range check is checking it once and for all before we fly with the engine running. Look at the numbers. If we see any big numbers like frame losses on any of the antennas, again, it's not gonna get better. Yeah. Change it, change it now on the ground. If we see a hold, that's when we really start investigating. I'm not anticipating it because We've done so many of these airplanes now, we True. kind of know where to put the um, antenna placement. We know that the sides, that faux carbon, the foam is, is not shielding at all. So we've stuck that all around, yeah. but it's still worthwhile just to check. And it's one of those diligence things. You know, I see people doing it at every event. Some people laugh at them. I'm like, it's the smartest thing in the world. Because you're checking the RF system. You're checking the, the receiver system. the defense, man. Yeah, so <laughs> take your time. It's a big investment. It's a big investment to you financially, also to the hobby. We don't want to be putting these things in fields if yeah. we don't have to. If you find something on the on the ground, great. It's yeah. fixable. Definitely. Okay. Well, I'll go to range check mode. Well, actually, okay. I'll hand that to you since you're going to do the walk. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and you want to do it off? Go that way, away from camera instead of... Well, I was going to talk about this, so... Oh. Just saying when you do it, just go that way. So, we... We touched already, think so. Yep. So we touched on, we're about ready to start, Steve. Yep. I want the top hatch off always, want to see what's going on. Yep. It's our first start, so I want to be monitoring fuel system, particularly this, this fuel line to the engine. This is my real telltale, if you okay. like. I can see air going through that. Right. If I see, and on the first, first start, it's not uncommon to see air because we've got a brand new system, yeah. brand new header tank. There will be air, particularly on the first, you'll see it when it goes click, click, click. You'll see a bunch of air going through mm. that's acceptable what i don't want to see is when we're doing full power checks which we do after the range check if there's still air going through that's when i need to start investigating okay. it can be as simple as a loose connection it could be as simple as a small pinhole in a fuel line yep. or the fuel tank itself but ideally what we're looking for after one or two minutes of running is the ability to transition the throttle up and down and not see any air. And it, you'd have to look really close. There may be m microscopic air bubbles coming through um, and that will affect the engine. So okay. there's that. Silly little thing makes a big difference, wind, when it comes to starting. Get it into wind. Let that airflow help you. It's only today actually quite windy, probably 10 mile an hour. But that 10 miles an hour will help the cooling process, help any heat distribution go through the airplane. We want to get basically as much heat as we can down the stainless steel, you know, silver part of that tailpipe. That's only purpose of that device in this airplane is to get rid of the hot air and the thrust out the sure. back. So if we can point, point into wind, that helps. Perfect. Crosswind isn't ideal, it's not killer. Downwind, I've seen it can be. If you have a stalled start where the air engine just starts to start and you get a big gust of wind come, it doesn't end bad. It doesn't end well, should I say, it ends badly. So <laughs> okay. always try and point into wind. On that subject, um, a secondary third effect of that is airmanship, just general um, etiquette. Think about where you're pointing it. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got a few hundred miles an hour of air coming out the back. It's quite hot, it can go quite some way. When you go to start, for instance, so we're gonna be here today, just pointing, sorry, yeah. We're gonna be pointing this way, which is great. Today we're set, there's no one there. But if I had a line of foam airplanes here, <laughs> either club modelers or spectators, don't. 
go and move over there. Just clear the way behind you. It's just a general safety, airmanship and etiquette thing. So Makes sense. Yeah, be mindful of that. I would do first start with brakes on. It's just okay. one more line of defense um, against it rolling away. Extinguish is set. Um, as you say, you've got it in range check. Stand. For me, always, always in front of the line of the turbine, your spinning part is here and the compressor mm. and the turbine and the turbine wheel. If anything is to go wrong, <laughs> it generally goes wrong outwards and sidewards. So sure. think about that when you have spectators as well, because there's nothing, certainly for newbies at clubs, nothing more fascinating than being here. <laughs> Listen, it's been a long time since I've seen a turbine let go. But once you've seen one let go, you never have people over the top of the turbine. So yeah, yeah. always have them around the front here. Safe. Extinguisher at hand and uh, yeah, we're good to go. All right. Well, it's on, it's hot. So what we need to do is run the trim all the way up and do a throttle up and throttle down to fire How are we doing up? with light, Pete? Are we, do you want us, do you want me on all ones? All right, Al, your head was just a little bit cut off where you were standing before. Other than that. Yeah, I can scoot forward and you can be right there. There you go. We're good there, right? Yeah, yeah. Is that camera looking okay? Okay. So start again with the we're ready to start. Yep. Okay. All right. All right. Ready to start. Airplane's been on this whole time. We've been chatting. Uh, everything's charged, fueled up, ready to go. So now let's run the throttle trim all the way up for the King Tech turbine startup sequence. All the way up, throttle full, throttle down, and it should begin its starting sequence. Yep, um, there are different sequences with different engines. Sure. You can also have a switch. Some people use an auxiliary switch, okay. which you can do on a King Tech. The most common way is with the trim, as you've got it set up. Um, one last check to do here, which is a such a common, it's unbelievable, is the valve. <laughs> yep, <laughs> and it is not on right now. It's good. I'd rather yep. have it not on yep. than you forgot to turn it off and you filled it. Now, there is a manual valve, um, comes with every King Tech engine. It's actually in the AMA guidelines as a suggestion. It it's a belt and braces safety device. Um, the engine has little solenoid valves that stop fuel from going into the uh, actual core itself. The shutoff valve is just a mechanical device that you shut off just in case one of those solenoids fails or just even sticks open, mm -hmm. it doesn't flood the engine. Again, one of those old school jet problems that doesn't seem to happen that often anymore, but once you see it happen, it's a mess because what happens is the engine fills with fuel. You don't see it pouring out. It pulls in the round can, first starts uh, sporty. So yeah, <laughs> so fuel valve on. You've got it set up as you say. Trim up, throttle up, throttle down. Throttle cut off. Oh. <laughs> throttle cut. <laughs> So, um, you've got your engine set up, Steve, on the conventional, what most people do, which is just the trim process. Just make sure there's no throttle cut switch activated. I'm a fan of disabling the throttle cut. It's one more switch that you can accidentally, inadvertently hit and shut the engine down. So, um, with that in mind, trim up. That arms the engine, that tells the ECU, hey, you know, we're ready to start. And then it's as easy as throttle up, throttle down. There's no real set time, just up and down. Okay. You can do it quick, sometimes it misses, but yeah. Engine's now spinning, you'll hear the uh, fuel pump start to run and the valve start to click open. You hear the ignition, that pop, mm -hmm. that was the engine on, on fire, for want of a better word. We <laughs> have ignition, so yeah. It's all automated, I can do whatever I want at this point. Engine doesn't care, the engine's taking care of itself. Okay. Never gets old. Sound is so cool. <laughs> awesome. So that's a light now. It's, it's running, but it's not sustaining. Like it's just going through a system check. Done. Done. That means it's on. It's running. Okay. So I'm going to go and walk and do a range check. A Get ready. Be mindful of where the exhaust goes. So you may want to move out a little bit. Yep. Pull the brakes off. There it is. So I've got the uh, range oh, uh, test button pressed down now. That's limited the actual power out of the radio. I'm gonna walk 30 paces, 35 paces. It's not an exact science. Looking at the numbers on my antennas, wiggling controls just to make sure I have constant control. I give Steve I sign now to rotate 90 degrees. This is probably the worst case scenario. Smallest frontal area in terms of antenna 
diversity. Still good. Another 90 degrees. Still no holds. The L antenna is the highest number, which is 289, 300. And one more. So it's back. Check with the controls. We're good. Yeah. Release. So we have three, four, five, and 30 and zero hold, which is perfect. So there we have it. Numbers were good, no holds. I was talking all the way through that, so yeah, it looked good. All right, I guess we go out and do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, oddly enough, we'll get this away from it. Yeah. Oddly enough, one of the harder parts of teaching people or getting people in through their first turbine flights is taxiing. The aeroplane takes a while to get moving in the sense that it's not like instant throttle response yeah. like a gas aeroplane would be. You haven't got the prop wash. So it takes a little bit of creeping up on the throttle to break ground, but then keeping the speed regulated. Yeah. A lot of people have a tendency to throttle up, throttle up, and then the aeroplane zooms off. Always have your hand on the brake. The brake's your savior. Yep. You know, it can help you a lot. Um, particularly on grass, where you've got the friction of grass, be mindful of that. So take your time taxiing, do loads of taxi tests, get your head around it again, particularly on grass if you've got the longer grass, which this aeroplane excels at, so it operates very well from grass. So very similar to any other test flight, you know, it's admittedly it's a jet engine, but it's the same physics, same aeroplane. Um, Eventualities is something that I go through a lot, particularly first flights of a jet, and that is having the worst case scenario laid out in your head. Today we've got a bit of a crosswind. We're here at Eli, familiar field, so there's not much suddenly gonna pop up. I still sight myself, I still go, okay, you know, something's gonna go wrong. And there's there's different places where things can go wrong where it's better than others. You know, I love a dead stick right there at <laughs> 30 feet where you just land. It doesn't always happen like that. So my first set of eventualities is always that first turn. What, what do I do if I just break ground, not high enough, or sorry, too high to just plonk it back down, which is at this place is pretty much anything over 20 feet. Where do I go? Now we have field which has been plowed to the left there, but that means putting us downwind. We have a lovely field over there, more into wind. That would be the way I'd go. So just have that laid out the same. Is if I'm downwind here, what's the point that I'm gonna turn around and come back in or go long? So sure. just have those eventualities sort of set out in your mind. To me, it's always a case of if you're prepared for it, then it doesn't happen. It's usually when you're not prepared, <laughs> you're rushing. So sure. yeah, have that in mind. First flight, just get it up. We're gonna program the gyro later. We're gonna get the feels right later. Get it up to a height where you're comfortable, not in the stratosphere. Sure. I'm not a fan of being so high that you can't see what's going on. Right. Certainly not too far away. And remember, it's a jet. It's, it's different to a propeller aeroplane in that if you leave the throttle pinned, it's just gonna get faster and faster and faster. <laughs> Things are gonna happen quicker. You're gonna be more stressed. Take check of the aeroplane. I don't, I don't mean drag it around, but get it once it's flying, look at the big picture and slow down, throttle back. We'll do 200 miles an hour later on. We'll do 150 miles an hour later on. Right now, we're just trying to get you settled, get the plane trimmed. So as soon as you're up there, gear away, throttle back a bit, take stock and be comfortable. So, okay. There you go. All right. We got mid flat, mid rates, and brakes are now coming off. Throttle going up. Being mindful to steer on our lovely Eli Field runway here. Hey. hey. Gear going away. Making our turn out. So that's it. To me, now you're at the point of coming back to the runway. So if anything happens here, you've got height and speed yep. that you can come back. Nice, good throttle check. I like to see that. Yeah, I'm about mid throttle. This is the, the bigger K, what, 85 alley? Mm -hmm. So. Yep. Throttle management is a little more key. When I did fly a 70, it was, you know, you're, you're in it a little more, yeah. but I'm always flying, it seems like I'm gonna be flying this thing at 50%. And uh, again, not too high here. But. Throw active as well is the yeah. thing that gets me. I see so many people now, a days, it scares the life out of me where their left hand comes off the throttle stick. 
Yeah. You, you can't with a jet. You, you, you have to be up and down. You know, when you turn downwind, for instance, it's going to pick up speed, come back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Vice versa, when you turn back into wind, try and aim for a constant speed. Look at the bigger picture. I mean, you're cruising now probably about 85, Sorry. 80 miles an hour. It's happy. It doesn't need to go any faster. No, no, no. Can you go faster? Yes, we'll do that later on. But get comfortable, get the airplane trimmed, dial the gyro in, get it set up how you want it, and then explore the flight envelope later. Yeah, and this is looking pretty darn solid. I gave it a little bit, a couple clicks of right aileron uh, from a trim perspective, but so far I haven't touched anything else. Okay. And uh, yeah, just cruising along here at 50, 60% throttle. Okay. And is there anything you do in a first flight to kind of check through the airplane or just try to get comfortable? I give it a few laps to make sure everything's good. A height and a position that I can get back to the field. I'm super mindful of that. I don't want to be like a three miles downwind low. Um, so there's that. Once I'm happy with the systems operating well, undercarriage away, no flame outs obviously, I'll do a control check. So I'll give it full aileron left and right. Okay. I won't go full up elevator, but I, I check the feel. Am I happy with mid rates? Right. You know, am I happy with that roll rate? Do I want more roll rate? Do I want less roll rate? I get my dual rate set up and then I'll start tuning on the gyro. I'm, as you said, super keen to get the gyro in as soon as possible. Ideally, I'd like to have a gyro element in on the first landing to help me. So with our AS3X systems, I'm pretty much done on three laps programming the gyro. It's, it's that easy. Other gyros are different, but get a feel of it. You know, get a little bit of height, get a little bit of speed so you're stressing the gyro and start blending it in. If it's on a switch, turn it on with your finger ready to turn it off if it oscillates. If it's on a rotary dial, gradually increase, 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 roll <coughs> and pitch and see if the gyro is starting to make it bounce. If it's starting to make it bounce, back off. Okay. Yeah, that's my general first flight regime or profile is get the airplane set, get the airplane reliable, check the controls how I want them, and then start tuning on the gyro. I always try and leave a minute or two, as long as you can, before the end of the flight to familiarize myself with the slow speed handling. Sure. I see a lot of people, the first time they fly a jet slow is when they come to land. And for the first time, that's a mega stressful time. So I always look at my time and allow two minutes okay. before the end of the flight to set the airplane up, put the gear down, put the flaps down, do any trim work you need to do with the flaps and gear down. So the airplane is flying straight. Everything you can do to make life easier for you, Steve. Yeah. You know, what you don't want is an airplane that's climbing all the time or rolling left all the time on your first landing. You don't right. want it on your 15th landing, but on your <laughs> first one especially. So yeah, get configured, get comfortable early. Yeah, and a, a big thing, you know, just flying this now for the, the maiden, obviously from the new jet guy perspective, I mean, I've flown one of these before, so yep. I'm not dead new to it but the throttle management is so different, like you mentioned, right. on a turbine. <laughs> you're like, oh, I added throttle, but nothing happened. Oh, there it is. You know, it's it's the subtle delay that you're just not used to. If, I mean, me flying prop planes my whole life, yeah. you have almost instantaneous power difference. Yep. And something like this, you know, it, it goes, but you know, and I'm vice adding throttle now. Well. Oh, there it goes. You know, it kicks in, you can notice it. And, and the slowing down. You've yeah, got all that energy down, yeah. and no drag. That's good point, you know, when you yeah. throttle back with a prop plane, you're almost, ah, yeah. oh, brakes are on. Right. With jets, no, it takes a while. So, yeah. yeah. So we're coming up on the two minute mark, Ali. So, gear down, um, flaps down. Yeah, so we'll do our first click of flaps here. Gear coming down. Be ready to do some trimming. We've got flight mode set up now, so yep. Yep. that means we can trim in every flight uh, mode, every flap stage, which I'm a big fan of. So you don't have to mess around putting programmable mixes. Sure. Take a couple of laps, take a couple of approaches, have the first couple of approaches set that you're going to wave them off. You're going to power off and go out of them. I'm going to do my next notch of flap, adding a little power. It's definitely power, slowing power down. Power, good, yeah. Yeah, and that's where we're going really heavy in the wind there. So. And you're going to turn down wind now, so be prepared. Keep the nose down a little bit, good. What you don't want to be is slow and dirty with the nose up at that stage. It will, any plane will bite. Yeah. So. Yeah, we got a lot of wind today. It's yes. The, we definitely didn't pick the calmest day to made in this thing, but. It's, it's uh, fall in <laughs> Illinois, Steve. This is it. <laughs> yeah. It's as good as we got. This. this is how it goes, so. Remember, right. the grass is good here, so don't fly it onto the runway. You know, don't damage the plane trying to hit the center line of the runway. But I think you should be fine. Coming out of the power. Nose down. Perfect. Leading it off. 
A little more rudder. There we go. Oh, a little yeah. bounce. There you go. Little steering. Brakes, brakes, brakes. Pulsing, pulsing. Stop done. Hey, we did it. Very nicely done, <laughs> bud. Nicely done. That was a dead 90 degree crosswind, so yeah, not the ideal conditions that we would hope for, but it went to show how well the, ha the plane handles. Also, how not to get too greedy. And by greedy, I've seen this a lot recently, is people trying to over flare, mm. more and more flare. It's better to put the airplane down level than it is trying to scoot it down. Vice versa, on the flip side of that, is don't let the aeroplane, don't force the aeroplane onto the ground. If it's not ready to land, it won't land. Mm -hmm. It's got a lot of lifting section. It's a very efficient, it's reasonably light for the amount of area it's got. So if it looks like it's going to touch down nose first, keep holding it off. I'd rather see you land down there. Sure. I'd literally see, rather see you land down there and take the grass than trying to force it down here. And what happens is you end up in this PIO situation where it bounces. Avoid that at all costs. Sure. Worst case, go round. There's no shame in it. You know, put the power on, wait for it to spool up. Don't lift the airplane up. Remember, the power is your thrust, is your control. So just keep it low, power, and go around again. Have another go. Yeah. So I've shut it down, obviously. Normally, we'd want to turn this into the wind here. But it's close enough. It's close it's enough. enough. Yeah. <laughs> so when you finish a flight on your first turbine, what are the things you look for? I mean, fuel consumption, UAT stuff. Yes. Obviously, uh, we can check batteries Again, later. start with airmanship. Don't be that guy or girl that taxis it back in and has it running, facing everyone. No one's your friend that way. Um, then, yeah, just a quick debrief. Go around the airplane. Check to see there's no fuel puddling. Check to see the UAT, your air trap, whatever you want to call it, the small tank. Mm -hmm. hasn't got loads of air in it. Some air is common, like a little bit at the top, but if you've got anywhere greater than, let's say, a fifth of the volume of your air trap is air, you've got a problem. Now that could be air leaking in from somewhere, it could be your clunk mm -hmm. not following the fuel around and, and investigate it. It's not gonna get better. None of this stuff gets better by itself. <laughs> I'm the worst at that. I think, oh, it'll be all right. No, it just gets worse. So take the time, check everything's tight. I'm a big fan of our spectrum telemetry because yep. it gives me an indication of what's going on battery wise. Investigate the batteries. Don't just take it for granted. If suddenly one of your batteries is down like a lot more than the other one or suddenly you notice that you're only getting five flights instead of 10 flights, investigate that. Something's drawing current. Use all of the data that's there on your fingertips to your advantage. Um, I, it's taken me a while to get there using our telemetry. Same with fades and holds. Look at them. Mm -hmm. Don't ignore them. Don't put blinkers on. Have a look at your fades. Accept those are okay. As soon as you see a H, investigate. Yeah. That's bad days. Like, vice versa as well. The more you investigate, the more familiar you get. If you notice something has changed, for instance, normally I have 300 fades on antenna ray. I've suddenly got 800. Yeah. Why is that? I had it recently, a guy, the airplane I flew, antenna had come loose <laughs> and it was floating around in his wedge, you know, underneath a, a fuel tank. Yeah. We yeah. caught it before we lost that antenna. So <laughs> yeah, just investigate, be diligent. These are such an investment, these airplanes. They'll last you for a long, long time if you look after them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ali. I can't thank you enough for walking me through this. Pleasure. And I hope that all of you guys enjoyed watching the kind of the progress as we got to the end. I'm sure this is going to end up being a very long video, <laughs> but you know, the whole thing for me when I asked Ali to help me with this was, I'm you know I'm a new guy at Jets. I'm not a new guy at RC, uh, and so you know bending Ali's ear and, and asking for your experience to kind of get me through it. Not everyone gets to hang out with Ali every day, but. <laughs> Having this kind of video series to walk you through, it might just help you be successful. And that's the whole point of the MB339 from Hangar 9 is get new people into the hobby and have a first experience that is fun. Exactly. <laughs> so thanks guys for watching. We'll see you later.